this morning and turn over to the book of Philippians. If you go to Philippians chapter 1, getting a little bit of a ring, could be these monitors. But if you'll find your place there in Philippians chapter 1, we looked at the first part of this chapter last week, and I want to continue a thought here of completely, really different spiritual truth, but it certainly goes hand in hand what we looked at last week. And so if you'll find your place there in Philippians chapter 1, we are looking forward to, in just a few weeks, it was mentioned during the announcement time for our anniversary service. We always have a good time of fellowship for that. Uh, we've never really called it a homecoming uh, because if it's been your home, it's only been for 19 years. So a lot of times we go back to places where grandma and grandpa are, where we were raised, but we've always celebrated our anniversary about that time, and we do have a good time doing that. And of course, we have a, a meal. We invite you to bring the food. You always do such a good job. We never bother uh, going backward and catering it. We just let you bring the stuff because it's always good. Uh, so we trust that you'll do that this year. And of course, invite a guest. Glad to have people come. Uh, sometimes we use it as an evangelistic outreach. We have many visitors that will show up and so forth. But it's just a great time of fellowship. We're looking forward to that here on uh, the 1st of May. As you find your place this morning in the book of Philippians in chapter 1, uh, let's take a moment and let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful this morning for the opportunity to study your word. We know the word of God has power to challenge us. We know this morning that the word of God could demonstrate to a person their lost condition and they need to know the Savior. There could be a believer today who's discouraged that could be brought to a place of great encouragement through the power of your word. Lord, we don't know what you might want to do in our midst today, but we know that you want to receive the glory, and we thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at the first part of this chapter, and we mentioned and said that it was really demonstrating a normal church. Now, I made the point of saying that not an average church, because there's plenty of average churches. That's pretty well a default position. Uh, if we could just kind of stay with our head above water, we might be where they were in Revelation 3, the Laodicean church, which was lukewarm, neither hot or cold. I don't think it would be a great ambition to be an average church, but on the other hand, to be a normal church would be something to achieve. But you know, if we find that place of being a normal church as the church at Philippi was, that is a church that Paul could thank God upon every remembrance, I think he makes the point now in the second part of this chapter that the state of being a normal church is not a stagnant state. It is not a place of, okay, we've achieved that, we're there, and now let's just continue where we are. A church has to continually be moving forward. Now, I want you to look at the passage in chapter 1 and verse 8, and he says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and the praise of God. It sounds like Paul said, even though I thank God for the church and every remembrance, I'm also now praying for the church that you would abound, that you would keep going, that you would move forward. So if last week we looked at a normal church, let's consider today an abounding church. And you know the fact is, a normal church is made up of normal Christians. An abounding church is going to be made up of abounding Christians. That doesn't mean that in a normal church there's not going to be some average ones, there's not going to be some below average, and perhaps uh, some that are abounding more than others. We're a mix, we're going to have people, but the Christian life is not a stagnant position, it is a life of moving forward. It is a life of growth. And when a church is where it ought to be, it has believers in it that are moving forward in their spiritual life. Hey, to live the life not of perfection, we will be that when we live with Jesus for all eternity. He'll give us a new body. Not a life where we never have to come and find 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible and tells us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Not a life where we never look and say, boy, there was a missed opportunity. Here was an area that I need growth in. Here's something I need surrender for. Hey, the excitement of living for the Lord Jesus Christ is that every day he can teach you something new. Every day you can find an area that he might need control of that he didn't already have. It is a life of growth and moving forward, and that's what a real abounding church ought to look like. Because the believers in it are moving forward in their spiritual life. 
hey, this is not something that is mere theory. It's not just something that perhaps would be good to consider, but God is saying that the normal state of things is an abounding state of things. So I want you to notice a couple of characteristics of the abounding church. One you might expect, first of all, is their progress. Now that just goes along with the word of abounding. There's some progress. Again, we read it in our text, and the first thing I noticed there is I noticed that when there's progress, there, there's an increase, a moving forward in our devotion. He says that I would, in verse 8 again, or verse 9, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. You know, the love in a Christian is certainly not something that we uh, fill up. It is something that God continually teaches us. Romans 5, 5 tells us that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Just like anything that I do in my Christian life, it is something that God works in me and continues to empower me to do. Listen, it is not natural to love like God tells us to love. It is certainly part of our being to uh, like people, to have a familial type love, like we love our mother, we love our children, that's there. But to love like God loves. You know what God did is he loved the unlovely. He looked down at sinners like me and sinners like you and said, even though this person takes my name and takes it in vain, I'm going to die for them in spite of that. Even though this person has murder in their heart and hatred, I'm going to die for that person. Even though this person has rejected my word, I'm going to die for them and give them an opportunity to have their sin dealt with. He loved the unlovely. Even when we were enemies of God, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God says that he wants that kind of love to be shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Now listen, I cannot love God as I ought to love him. I mean, we're commanded to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. The only person who really believes they've achieved of leaving, loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind is somebody who does not understand what it means to love God with your heart, soul, and mind. I mean, to really allow that to take over your soul and to put him at the supreme being in front of everything you do, hey, that can only be achieved by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you know, it also takes God's power and help and divine enablement to love others. You know, Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one toward another. Why is that such a great testimony? Why is it that somebody would say, well, we know that that person's not uh, in the Lions Club or they're not part of the uh, Masons or I know that person must not be part of the uh, PTA or whatever, no slam on that particular group. I'm just saying they might recognize it's not one of those groups. They must be Christians because they love each other. Now, unfortunately, that testimony hadn't always been what it should have been, but that's what God would have for us. It's to demonstrate that there's something there. There's a bond. Well, it comes by the Holy Ghost. Now, that devotion, you notice a couple of specific things. It says knowledge and judgment. You know, when God begins to develop that devotion in us where we love him more, we know him better, like Paul says in this same book, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. When that begins to happen, well, it comes, first of all, by knowledge. You know, the better we know him, the more we walk with him, the more he works in us to will and do his good pleasure. I mean, I get to know him by finding out about him, by talking to him, communicating, listening to his voice through the word of God. I get to know him better. And then, of course, the judgment. The judgment takes place, and you know what happens? Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. You know, the more you love, the more you hate. You see, I, if I love my family, then I'm going to have a disdain for anybody who's against them or hurts them or does something bad to them. Well, the more I love God, the more there's going to be a disdain for the things that displease Him. Now, I will qualify and say it's already easy for me to have a disdain for the things that you do that are against God. But when you really start growing, you have a disdain for the things that I do when they displease God. You see, it's easy to say, yeah, that stuff's awful. Our culture's bad. Those people aren't what they ought to be. But the Spirit of God, when he begins to deal in your heart, you think, no, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. 
and I love the Lord, and I don't want to do anything that displeases Him. So a, a progressing church is a church that progresses in their devotion. But then also, I think you'll notice here, it says that you may approve the things that are excellent. Now, I think we also are going to see a progress in our discernment to understand what God would see as excellent, to approve those things. And the Bible tells us in Romans 14, 13, that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know, this comes down to making a right decision. You know, when I progress in my life, I will begin to learn and discern. And by the way, there's room for that in our lives. I mean, God expects us not to immediately have all knowledge. We find in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. My discernment begins to increase as I begin to grow in the word and begin to understand what pleases God. I begin to realize, wait a minute, some things before that didn't bother me. God really wouldn't want that in my life. So how do I decide? How do I get that discernment? How do I choose? Well, I'll tell you one way to start it is just give God the benefit of the doubt. When you begin to wonder if it's right, then why don't you wait and find out that it is before you engage in it? Uh, you've probably heard the story about the uh, fellow who was a wealthy man, lived out in the West somewhere, and he was looking for a limousine driver. And he wanted, of course, uh, to get the best one he could, so he put out some uh, uh, interviews and had some people to come. And the first guy came in, and he explained to him, he said, now look, you're going to be driving me all over the place. And he said, there's a a mountain pass, you're familiar with it, it's up on highway such and such, and it drops straight off, and there's just enough room for two cars to go through there. Have you ever driven on that area? Oh, yeah, I've driven there many times. He, I said, are you, he says, are you comfortable with that? I mean, you, can you drive up there? He said, look, I can get on that stretch of road, it's about a mile, drop straight off. He said, I really could drive right down that thing at 60 miles an hour, six inches from the edge, not even break a sweat. Well, that was kind of impressive. Wow, that's pretty good. Next guy comes in, he interviews him, almost same story, explains to him, section of road, whatever, what do you think, can you handle that? The last guy I just interviewed said he could do 60 miles an hour, six inches away from that road, not even break a sweat. How about you? He said, I could run down that thing 60 miles an hour and run right up to the white line. I'm so used to it, going through it many times, it wouldn't even blink. So then he brings the third guy in, explains the same story, says, look, this same section of road, whatever, what about you? This last guy said he could do six inches. This guy said right on the line. Are you comfortable with that? He said, man, when I go down that road, I stay as far away as the edge I can get. He said, you're hired. <laughs> now, he lost a job two weeks later to an illegal immigrant. But anyway, he, he, he got hired. But, hey, the fact is, I don't want to see how close I can get to wrong. I don't want to see just how bad could I really get and not displease God. My discernment says, you know what? I'm going to start giving God the benefit of the doubt. Man, I wonder if it'd be okay uh, to watch this program. I mean, I know it's got a couple of things that make me cringe, but it's got some educational value to it. Well, you know what? Why don't you wait till God convinces you it's right before you soil your conscience? You know, I don't know if I really ought to go to this place. I'm a little uncomfortable here sometimes, but it has this positive aspect. Hey, maybe it is okay, but why don't you give God the benefit of the doubt till he convinces you it's okay? I mean, the fact is, why would I take a chance on doing something that might displease God? I'd rather give God the benefit of the doubt. Now, maybe you grow. Maybe you begin to get more knowledge. Maybe you find out some new information. God gives you clarity, and you've got a clear conscience, and it doesn't violate God's word. But until it does, why don't you give God the benefit of the doubt? That's discernment. He says, I want you to approve not just the acceptable things. That's what an average church does. Why don't we just approve what's acceptable? But he says, no, I want you to approve what's excellent. I want to give God the best. Now, that discernment also goes hand in hand with something else we're going to progress in. And this sort of is almost redundant, but our development. Now, how does it happen? It doesn't happen overnight. Because that verse goes on to say, approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now, this builds because it explains to me. Of course, my devotion uh, is, gives me knowledge and judgment. That judgment begins to progress, and I begin to get discernment and say, wait a minute, I'm going to give God the first uh, step. And then God begins to teach me things. And then he says, here's where I want you to come from, not only a right decision, but a right source. Where's it going to come from? 
to be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. You know what the word sincere comes from a Latin word, and I'm going to butcher the word, but it's kind of like two Latin words, sena sera, makes sense. And it means without wax. Now, I know you're not going to look that up, so I feel pretty comfortable. But anyway, what that meant was back in the day, where the, the origin of this was people would make pottery. There was one particular type of pottery. It was very difficult to detect if it was flawed, but the people that were really good at it, uh, if they heated it just right or put too much heat, it would crack it, but it was still, you could look at it and hardly tell the difference. They would take wax, and they would fill the crack, and they would smooth it off, and you'd look at that. It would shine. It would look nice. You wouldn't have any idea, but there was one way to tell. Hold it up to sunlight. When you hold it up to the sunlight, there'd be a little area, and you could tell where the wax was. So the, the crooks would uh, sell, a, uh, sell one of these, and somebody unsuspecting would buy it and realize that it was not sincere. It looked good on the outside, but it had a flaw on the inside. Well, that word kept that meaning, without wax. And they began to apply it to lives, again to apply it to people. Uh, what about you? Or it was figurative in a sense. Are you without wax? Are you the real deal? Or you just look good on the outside? Can you see why Paul would pick a word like this, that we might be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ? That is, it ought to come not just, look, I discern. But what is my discernment based on? Well, I know when I'm around them folks at Tri-City Baptist Church, I mean, this is what you're supposed to do. Well, that's great, but I hope it comes from something besides that. I hope there's something on the inside that produces it. Listen, I had rather you live half holy and be sourced from the inside than look real holy and it just be on the outside. I mean, I want you to come not just from a right decision. I know what right is. I know what wrong is. But I want it to be sourced from inside. I mean, that's what Paul is getting at. That this thing builds, it progresses. You know, we are so anxious to put a label and a tag on what's Baptist, what's biblical, what's Christian, or whatever it might be. Do you realize there might be somebody today who was saved for six months, engaged in an activity that would appall you, and yet you're not engaged in that activity. You've been saved for six years, but they're farther along spiritual than you are. It's not the inherent acts it's what makes you do those acts, sincere and without offense. Paul said, I want to see that develop in your life. You know, when I think about the, uh, the source, when I think about this development, I think about what Paul said in Galatians chapter 5. He said, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. He's speaking there to law keepers. He was speaking there to people that were very anxious to, to keep the, the, the letter and the outward circumcision and so forth that the, the Jews had enforced. And just for the sake of keeping it, for, to keep face among their peers, he said, don't get entangled in that. He said, let it come from the liberty Christ has given us to do right. Now look, we were already slaves to sin. We already had ability to do wrong. God has now empowered us, given us a source to be able to do right. Uh, Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's freedom. So he says this development will come from the inside. But then I want you to notice not only the discernment that we have and the devotion that, of course, that comes from, and the development, but he mentions in verse 11 our deportment. He says, being filled with the fruits of of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the praise, our glory and praise of God. Now, in contrast to that, uh, an average Christian, an average church, we slip into the, if we slip into the Laodicean, lukewarm state, then it becomes, we become filled with the fruit, fruits of the flesh for the glory and praise of man. But we ought to be to the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto his glory and praise. Now that does come down to how you live, your deportment, how you carry yourself, how people view you. Now I, I agree, we can, we can run on one side and say, yes, it doesn't really matter what you do, it's why you do it. it you're, you're, uh, the source of your actions and your discernment, yet only matters on the inside. But let me tell you, when you get the inside straightened out, it will show itself on the outside. Fruits of righteousness. 
be easy to have just a cop out and say, well, God is just interested on the inside. No, he's just interested on you depending on him on the inside. But a good thermometer is, what has it done on the outside? Are there any fruits of righteousness? I mean, what is the fruit of righteousness? Well, I think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Those are kind of inward too, aren't they? Here's the outward, the long-suffering, the gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. I mean, to be able to see a person who's under control, to be a, see a person who isn't uh, uh, lose it every time he's uh, going up against a difficult situation. To see a person who knows how to control his tongue, to control his temper, to see one who's worried about his testimony among others. Hey, it matters, the fruits of righteousness. So we get it from a right decision, that's our discernment. We get it from a right source, but it produces the right actions. See, it works because I've devoted myself and I'm walking with God. It's a pretty simple thing. God says he's concerned about our progress. We've got to move forward. But you know, as I look at this passage, I notice the advancing church, a church that abounds. We're concerned with their progress, but then Paul goes on by giving his own testimony. He shows you that the advancing, abounding church has a characteristic of pursuit. Look, if you would, in verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Now, Paul wrote the Philippian epistle from jail. The, the people in Philippi well knew that. I mentioned last week, we went back to the book of Acts. And of course, this church began with Paul going to Philippi. And before he left Philippi, he was in jail. Now, he got out of jail. But then it wasn't too long, he went back to jail. He actually gets out again and ends up back in jail. I mean, he went into a town and he would look at the Airbnb app. He'd look at the prison app and see what kind of places they had available because that's where he was going to end up. I mean, he would, the fact is, he ended up there numerous times. Why? Not because he broke the law, but because he stood for the gospel message. He says, brethren, the things that happened unto me have happened unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, he mentions that a couple of times. In fact, in verse 12... He said it happened unto the furtherance of the gospel. In verse 17, he says, The other love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So the church that is abounding has a concern, has it as its foremost goal, is centered around the gospel. I mean, that's what it's about. Not the social gospel. Not the gospel in name. Not this subjective term that people uh, use that really just means evangelical religion. I'm talking about a true life-changing message that points you to a person who is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, that points you to a place, and that is a cross, where he died for all sin. It points you to the power of a resurrected person who came out of the grave. I mean, this message is a great message. So what does the abounding church, Paul mentions this, what is he going to do with the gospel? Well, the first thing he's interested in is distribution. He says, these things that have happened unto me, he doesn't, notice he doesn't just say because of the gospel. Now, I might not be surprised if Paul said, I'm in jail today because I preached the gospel. That is true. The things which have happened unto me, brethren, have happened because we preach the gospel and that's just the way it is and you just got to accept it and if you preach it, you're going to. Now that might be true, but that's not what he said. He said the things that have happened unto me have happened unto me unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now there's a couple of things I notice about this. Paul is making an emphasis now because this is what an abounding church does. We start off, we grow, as we talked about in our progress. He prayed for this. He knew it needed to happen. The church begins to abound. They begin to produce the fruit of righteousness. They're moving forward. Paul said, that's good. You're going to grow because here's what's going to come up. Just like with me, I'm in jail, but God's got me here for a reason. I'm in jail to further the gospel. You know, logically, that doesn't make much sense. Wait a minute, Paul. You used to plant churches. You used to go to these towns and you'd... Uh, talk to people and you were free to go door to door and you had meetings and uh, you'd go by the temple and boy, we read all these places. Now you're stuck in the middle 
of a jail cell. Paul says, God's got me here to get the gospel out better. You know, his ways are not our ways. I don't know what God's put you through or me through. I don't know what kind of difficulty we've gone through, but you know it's legitimate for me to believe that what God is doing through my life may well, in fact is as a Christian, part of his program of getting out the gospel. Now, on the one hand, we could view it like this. We could view it and say, well, you know, we know that uh, Paul mentions here that he had been a witness to the soldiers, to Caesar's guard that were in the prison. It even says, so that my bonds in Christ, in verse 13, are manifest in all the palace. Already the Gentiles know, man, who is this preacher that we've got down here? He keeps witnessing to our guards. They had to sit with him for eight hours a day, by the way. That was their job. Eight-hour shifts, they chained themselves to Paul. He was that important of a prisoner. And, of course, Paul wasn't trying to get away, but he said, okay, fresh meat. Bring them on in. And, I mean, you got eight hours with a preacher here. He slept a little bit, ate a little bit, but you know, and he won them to Christ. He says down here in verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Indicating he had produced fruit right there in prison. He had seen uh, folks back. In fact, he went on to Christ one day. Then, of course, they had to come back and sit with him again. He started going through the discipleship books with him and so forth. Uh, it was a very interesting time. You say, well, Paul was planting great churches. He was, uh, people were being saved by multitudes and big. Why would God be interested in just them handful of guards? Do you know we don't really, I'm sure, grasp the value of one soul. You say, I went through all of this and this difficulty and this trial I had to face and one person got saved if one person stayed out of hell for all eternity and God used you to be an influence, it would matter. Now, he may use you for many more, but if he used you to influence one soul who was lost and now they're saved, it'd be worth it in God's mind. But Paul meant it even further than this. See, Paul certainly wanted to... Uh, the gospel to go out, but he recognized that the gospel, the persecution that goes with it is inherent. You see, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you uh, thought about, you know, of course, you know what the Midas touch is from King Midas, everything you touch turned to gold. It seemed like a great thing. I love gold, and if I touch this, touch that, and of course the story goes, he ends up touching his child and his food and all this type of thing. Well, you know, if God gave you the Midas touch in life, that sounds like that'd be wonderful. Sounds like it would just be great, man. Nothing ever went wrong. Everybody I talked to got saved. I never was, uh, never got up on a Sunday morning and thought, man, I sure love to sleep an extra 30 minutes today. I mean, never struggled with temptation or my mind going in places it shouldn't go or even losing it or not using my tongue. Boy, wasn't that great if I had the Midas touch in that sense? You think it would, just like King Midas did. But we are cut out that we need God to test us. It builds strength. It builds character. It causes us to depend on him. See, I'd love to tell you that if God just gave me the ability that everything I touch turned to spiritual gold, that'd be great. But I'll tell you what would happen very quickly is I would depend on me. But we go through that difficulty and that trial and that struggle we need what we don't have automatically, the grace of God. God gives us grace. Now, Jesus said, look, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. It, he didn't say I'm going to remove the difficulties. He said, but be of good cheer. I'll give you grace when you need it. Now, that's inherent. But you know, the gospel also, Paul makes the point, was invaluable. I mean, how significant is this gospel message that he's talking about. He didn't say these things have happened that I might be a better Christian. He didn't say these things have happened unto me just because I needed this and God's teaching me something. It happened to the furtherance of the gospel. Listen, this man's life, he recognized it. God inspired him to write it because the gospel is far more significant perhaps than the world recognizes today. Romans chapter 2 and in, uh, verse uh, 16, I believe it is, Paul said, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You know, it was pretty important that Israel was having a, a conflict last night. That's significant. It matters that there's a war over in, the, in Europe. 
that, that's probably going to affect us in some way with all the things that are going on there. Um, the election coming up in the United States, the whole world will be affected by who wins that. All of that stuff is, is, is it's important. It affects your life. It's significant. It pales in comparison to the significance of the gospel. I mean, the old-fashioned message that Jesus saves, that he was lifted up, that he died for sinners, that he's willing to save you. Listen, all of these are temporal consequences. What you do with Jesus is eternal. And there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I mean, the consequence of the gospel is is tremendous. It's huge. And for a church, listen, do you know, think about it. Who has been given the stewardship of something that important? He's handed it to the church. Tri-City Baptist Church is a stewardship of something that God has committed to us that is bigger than any current event you can consider today. Now, I'm not talking about just merely, hey, we ought to witness more. I'm not just saying, yeah, we ought to give out some tracts. All that's, that's true, we do, personally and as a church. I'm talking about that message is eternities at stake. It's a consequential message. Paul said, these things that happened unto me, they're centered around this. So that not only here, but in all the palace, people have heard about Jesus. Now, he goes on to talk about, there was even folks that didn't, uh, didn't, that, that didn't like Paul, and they thought it'd make it worse on him if, he, if they preached the gospel. We'll go out and tell some more people about Jesus, then Paul will have a rougher time, because that'll make Caesar mad. It's amazing that that took place, but sometimes the devil works in that way. But Paul said, I don't care. He said, either way, whether they do it in pretense, whether they do it for real, in fact, you read it down in verse uh, 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. The other of love, doing it the right way, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice and will rejoice. You know, the fact is, the gospel, he, he dealt with its distribution, but he also dealt with its defense. He said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Now, if God's placed that in our hand, that means we got to defend it, doesn't it? Don't get me wrong. We don't have to defend the Bible. We contend for it. God's already given it to us. It can stand head and shoulders above all. It can stand the critics. It can take it. It's shown over the years. It doesn't need you. This is God's word. Not going to change. But to have a defense of the gospel is a term that reminds us that there's a battle. There's a battle for the gospel message. The devil knows more how consequential it is than believers do. He knows there could be folks listening right now this morning that are on the verge of will I take Jesus or will I receive him? I'll put it out of my mind. I don't care, but they know if the devil can wait, get them to wait just one more day, one more service, one more hour, they'll be in hell for all eternity. The devil knows. We forget, but there's defense. You know, there's terms in the Bible, for instance, over in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Paul is writing there to Timothy, and he says, Be strong, therefore, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath called him to be a soldier. A soldier. He uses a military term. He's going to mention as well to Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith. Uh, He says right before he dies, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, when it talks about the devil and his spiritual warfare, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, there is a defense of the gospel. How does that defense take place? That defense takes place primarily in prayer. It really is prayer. Paul said, I thank God upon every remembrance of you praying always. He said, I'm uh, looking for you to grow. I want you to reprove. I'm praying that God would do this. Primarily, it's fault in prayer. What's your prayer life today? You know, as a Christian, a church is made up of individual Christians. Our church will rise and fall. Our effectiveness, our stewardship of the gospel on 
our prayer life. How we get a hold of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor is not in vain. How do we abound? Steadfast, unmovable. That's defense. How do you stay steadfast and unmovable? You go to God and ask him for his power. God answers prayer. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power which worketh in us, God answers prayer. How is it going to be defended? We defend it in prayer. I mean, that's where the battle is won. That's what makes the difference. And we're not talking about just, hey, that's wonderful. Somebody got sick. We prayed they got well. I'm all for that. God can help us in that. But I'm talking about fighting a spiritual battle. God, we need to move forward. We need to have your power. We need to have your protection. We need your name to be glorified. We need to move forward spiritually to grow. All of these aspects are answers. And by the way, legitimate prayer requests because God promised he wanted to do it. You pray about something God's already promised he wanted to do, and I'll tell you what God's going to do. He's going to answer. I mean, it's not like he has a fight with the devil. He just casts them aside. I mean, I don't want to look trite at this because it's bigger than this, but this is just kind of an illustration in a sense. The devil's working hard as he can, giving it everything. He's fighting, and a Christian prays. And God says, do you hear that devil? Moves him right out of the way like he's not even there. That's all I was waiting on. You knew I could have done this anyway. I was just waiting for that Christian, so that's it. The rules have been kept. Now I'm going to give you some open door here. I mean, God can defeat the devil anytime, right? But he set it up that we pray. And we ask God, and he works. Now, there's uh, certainly the, the distribution of the gospel and the defense of the gospel. And then you notice, and I'll end with this, the delight of the preaching of the gospel. You know, he said in verse 18, at the very end, I therein do rejoice and will rejoice. He rejoiced, first of all, that there was participation. Verse 14, many of the brethren in the Lord Waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, here's how Paul viewed it. I'm in jail for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, first of all, I've won these soldiers to Christ. I told them about Jesus. They've heard, not all of them, some may have rejected. But I've won some of these soldiers to Christ. If, that's, if one soul got saved because I'm in jail, thank God. But it's not unlike the Lord to do things we don't even see. So Paul says, you know what, since I've been here, I found out many of the brethren are much more bold to speak the Lord or speak about the Lord without fear because I'm in here. You know, if Paul, boy, I haven't suffered nearly as much as he has. I haven't had to go through that. Boy, if Paul can preach the gospel, I'm going to step up as well. It, you know what, God is not looking for a handful of us to get busier. He's not looking for a few people that are committed to the gospel to do more. Now, possibly some of us could. He's looking for more people to participate. You see, he said, look on the fields, they're white unto harvest. He said, I pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He rejoiced over the participation. And then, of course, he rejoiced over the preaching. To think that the word of God was preached. Why is it so exciting that the gospel is preached? Because there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You realize this morning, just preaching the Bible in these few moments, likely God has put somebody under conviction. There's somebody sitting in here or watching a live stream, almost for sure, who says, I need Jesus. I need to be saved. Frank Bailey can't do that. Walter Smith can't do that. Tony Campbell can't do that. John Joe can't do it. But God just like that. Use somebody you never heard of to speak the word of God and put them, you've experienced it if you're saved today, at some point God got a hold of your heart and you said, boy, that's what I need. How in the world got that old stubborn, blubbering speech that I just heard? I don't know, but boy, there's something in here. God does that. That's the thrill. That's the excitement. And that's what Paul said, the gospel is preached. I was in Maryland a number of years ago. I was probably, I don't even think I was married at the time, so it's probably eight or ten years ago. But I was a young boy out. I was inviting some kids to come to the, the meeting, the gospel meeting. I was preaching, but we were out inviting people. 
And I caught this one kid. I don't even remember his name. It's been so long. But I remember it was by a laundromat. And he rode his bicycle up. And I happened to walk out about the time he was riding up. I think I, I was just happened to be there. And I called him. Hey, did you hear about what we're doing over here at the church? And we're having these games. And we're having this meeting and so forth. And got him excited. He thought, yeah, I'll come. Well, a lot of kids tell you that. Some come, don't, some don't. But he did. And here's why I remember him. He showed up that night, and we didn't have a huge crowd anyway. And when I saw him, he had the same bicycle and basically the same clothes. And I said, man, that's the kid I talked to at the laundromat. Met him, talked with him. That night, we had a three-night meeting. The first night, he was saved. Of course, I was thrilled that he got saved. Isn't that wonderful? The guy came in, he got saved. Well, the next night, he showed up and had four more friends with him. Of course, he invited his kids to come. He wanted them to come see what he had happened. Of course, he enjoyed the games and so forth. But he wanted to get more people there. All four of those kids got saved that night. Third night, he brought three more friends. Do you know all three of those friends came and trusted the Lord as well? I mean, what could be more thrilling than to see God save somebody? That's where the joy. Now, you know when an abounding church is going to progress in their spiritual life and pursue the gospel. And that's what it looks like. Let's have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and we're going to pray. And perhaps you're here today. Maybe you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. Now you know about him. You've heard about him. But have you been born again? Do you know for sure today you're on your way to heaven that you're saved? You know I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out. That wouldn't help at all. But I would remember you into prayer if I could pray for you. You may even be on live stream today and I can't even see you. But God knows who you are. But if you'd say, I'm concerned about my soul. I... I want you to pray for me. I want God to make this matter clear to me. And I want you to remember me in that prayer. Could I remember you by a raised hand? You'd say, yes, remember me as heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that at all? As I just scan the audience, I may see your hand. I may miss it. But if God's spoken to your heart, I'd like to pray for you. There could be Christians today, believers. You know you're saved on your way to heaven. Maybe there's areas in your life that you need to surrender Things that God is dealing with you about, and you want me to remember you in the prayer. Could I pray for you by a raised hand, someone like that? Yes, thank you. God, we'd ask you to work in our hearts today. You know what the needs are. There could be those today that do not know you as Savior. I pray you'd show them their need, that this would be the day they would come to receive you. Lord, we pray for believers today that need strengthening, helping in their life, that they would make that decision, and they would uh, put you first and foremost in their life. Lead now, we pray in the invitation time in Jesus' name. While heads are bowed, we'll stand. Our